Okay. So that's all I was planning on saying about section 4.2. Are there any other questions on that specifically? I mean, you guys got to try it out before you have questions. Okay. Um, 4.3, we, we've done most of 4.3 already. So now I just want to come back and make it a little more formal. Um, just because I couldn't stop myself from talking more about second derivative than I did already. So somebody help me out. If, uh, if f double prime of uh, some value of x is greater than 0, then what does that mean? Concave up, which so it would look like this around a, right? Okay. And if f double prime of a is less than zero, it look like that around a, right? And it doesn't have to have to make that shape. It just if it's increasing and it's concave up, it would do like that. If it's increasing and it's concave down, it would do like that. So it doesn't actually have to make that u shape. It just has to have that curvature to it. So the second derivative measures curvature. First derivative measures increase, decrease, right? Second derivative measures curvature, what we call concavity. So I'm sure some of you guys have heard of concave lenses versus convex lenses, possibly. And concave is the one that caves in, and that's, there you go, concavity. How's it caving in? Right? I like it. Okay. Uh, oh, and if f double prime of a equals zero, that's the possible location of an inflection point, which is sort of like the idea of max and min. Inflection point, if it is an inflection point, so for the first derivative, if it's a critical number, it might be where the function itself gets the most or least, right? Max or min. Second derivative critical numbers are where the function might have the biggest slope or the smallest, or you know, the biggest positive or the biggest negative slope. So it's a nice analogy there. First derivative, it might be the function hits the biggest and smallest points. Second derivative, it's where the slope is the biggest, positive or negative. So it's almost the same thing, right? Yeah, maybe. All right. Because what is the second derivative? It's the derivative of the derivative. So what does the derivative tell you? How much something's changing. So the second derivative tells me how much the slope is changing. So when the second derivative is zero, that's going to be when a place where the slope is the biggest or the, or the biggest positive or the biggest negative. Okay. So that's the idea of second derivative. Let's do something nice and concrete with this. So we're going to do an entire problem together with graphing based on what we see. And then I got, you know me, I've got another handout, Mr. Handout, uh, where you guys get to try one on your own. So let's see what kind of freakiness we can do here. Oh, let's try that. That looks freaky. Um, is that too freaky for us right now? Yeah, it's not good. Let's do this here. Sure. Okay. All right, so what I would ask you is a lot like that handout I gave before. I would say find uh, the critical points. Uh, find f prime, and then find the critical points. So what's f prime? Four x cubed. Minus four x. Minus four x. I love it. All right. So then, define the critical numbers. Is that equal to zero? Nice and easy to factor this. Four x. And it will be x squared minus one, which is. Plus one. So then what are my critical numbers? Zero. 
bigger one, and one. Kick ass. Now, I am going to ask you later about concavity, so it almost makes more sense to use the second derivative test, maybe. Do you guys follow? Or maybe we should do the first derivative just to remember. So let's, let's do the first derivative test. So uh, now I'd say find the local maxes and mins. So that's where you do what? If I want to use the first derivative test, what do I do? Draw your number line. I like it. Negative 1, 0, 1. These are all places where the derivative is 0. Trust me on this. You want to put a little u up there so when you're collecting answers, you know you can't use that. It's undefined here, so it's no good. And I've talked about this hopefully enough. All the multiplicities are 1. So all I need is one region, and the, the signs change everywhere, right? So if I plug, I can't plug zero in, too bad for me. So if I plug a two in, positive, positive, positive. Cool. So everybody with me. And I plugged it in here, thank God. I'm investigating the slope right now. Why does that make sense? Because if I know the slope is positive and then negative, well, then that must be a max. So that's why it makes sense I'm looking at the slope that's first derivative right now. So this is positive. So what's it going to be there? <coughs> no. Are we not cool with multiplicities yet? Watch this. Watch how simple this is. I really want you to get this. Uh, around one, this will be different signs, won't it? So if it's more than one, this is positive. If it's less than one, this is negative. Does this care? If I'm really close to one, this is always positive. It's like, what the hell are you talking? And so, and this, if it's really close to one, it's always positive. So if they're odd multiplicities, it will change sign around its root. So here it's positive, so here it's got to be negative because it went around 1, so that's now going to be negative. Don't make too big of a deal. Multiplicity is an awesome idea. It's a relatively simple idea that makes this kind of work quick. I don't want to plug freaking one half in. Don't make me do that. I don't want to. But if you did, you could. So what's going to be there? Positive, because around this, whoops, this, on one side is 0, it's positive. On the other side is 0, it's negative. That's what just happened, isn't it? We went to the other side of zero. It's negative now. And what's it going to be there? Negative. Crazy. So depending on how you want to draw this, uh, this is going to be decreasing here. And then flat. Increasing flat. Decreasing flat. Increasing. Now real quick, who remembers N behavior? <coughs> Anybody remember N behavior? What would the N behavior of this thing be? Touchdown, right? Yes. Okay. And behavior's like this, because it's x to the fourth. It's an up parabola, right? It's an even power, and it's positive. Did that match? Yes. It's like that, with weird shit in the middle, right? The end behavior is this. Kick ass. So you have all these checks and balances that come into this. You can step back from that and say, does that make sense? And you can see a real easy mistake, really, real quick. Uh, are there maxes and mins? How many mins are there? Two. So now, to find the mins, it's a negative one comma something. Yeah, good. Uh, when you plug a negative one in, you get one minus two. It's negative one plus three. Two. two. All right. And then also at, so this is a min, and there's a min at one something. Some of you guys hopefully realize it's the same thing. Because it's all even powers up there, right? And then there's a max at zero. Zero kicks ass. Three. Okay, I like it. I like it. How are we doing so far? So this is all stuff you've done already. Now let's add in the new stuff. So I, and now I know it looks like this. That is clunky. That is... You know, early Nintendo game. This is, I don't, I need more resolution than that, right? Mario's awesome, but he's not very high resolution. So the curvature gives us one more degree of resolution, right? Um, so now find F double prime. So what's the second derivative going to be? Yeah, 12x squared minus 4. 
what are the critical numbers going to be? They don't have to be pretty, and unfortunately here they are not. Uh, plus minus one over three. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah, almost. So you get x squared equals four over two and one third. So x equals plus or minus one over rather. X squared. Cool. I like it. Nothing pretty. Now here's this is new, but it's gonna feel like it's old. I investigate critical numbers. I don't care which derivative they came from. I can use the same process. So it's a zero here, zero here. Can you guys see what the multiplicities of this of each of these would be? If you did factor this, wouldn't it be one each, right? So isn't the multiplicity one for each? It's a really good thing to realize. One over root three is an ugly number. I actually don't care because I know zero is between them. Right? So if I plug a zero in, what do I get? Zero, zero minus four, I get a negative. negative number. If I plug in uh, 10 million, it doesn't matter. I don't have to actually do it because what's it going to be? Positive. But if it did plug in 10 million, you can see very quickly, it's going to be huge minus four is positive. Right? And of course, the same thing's going to happen because it's squared. If you put in big negative, Gonna come out positive. Okay. So what does that mean? What can you draw underneath? This is where people gotta be careful. This is the second derivative. It tells me the shape, it tells me the curvature, right? So here it's gonna have what kind of curvature? Up. Here it's gonna be down. Here it's gonna be up. So are these true inflection points? Inflection points mean that the concavity changed. Just like uh, maxes and mins means the direction changed. So did the concavity change for each? Yes. Yes, so the inflection points are... What? Oh, they're yummy. Uh, negative 1 over rad 3, comma, something. Somebody help me out. Don't round it at all. Throw it in there. What's negative 1 over rad 3 squared? One third, and then that squared again is one ninth. So you don't care about the fact that there's a square root because you're going to immediately square it and square it again. Who cares? The rad goes away. So when I plug it in, I get one ninth minus two times one third plus three. So what is that? It's 27 minus six minus one plus one. 28 minus six is 22 over. Nine, is that right? Twenty-two ninths? Or are you guys just standing there? <laughs> I'm gonna wait till you're done. I don't know what happens. So we cool that out, yeah. I think so. Twenty-two nines, so like uh, I don't even know what that would be. What would it be, John? Twenty-two nights. And isn't that true for the other one also? I mean, right, is that cool? Of course, it's going to be the same for the positive because it's going to be the same exact numbers at the end. I'm going to square it in fourth power. There's a lot of symmetry in this function. All right. How are we doing so far? What did you plug in that to get the 22? How did you get that? So if I ever want to know where the function is at a certain x value, I've got to plug it back into the original okay. function. And then I squared it, and that's why the radical went away, so I didn't really need to know what that was. Leave it in that form. Don't round it. And then plug it in. Put the whole damn thing in. I like it. Okay. All right. So let me do this. I need space for graphing this. So let me try to uh, summarize what we know. So what do we know? We know. Oh, let me come back here real quick. Uh, the minimum occurs at negative one two and one two. There's a max at 0, 3. So where is this increasing? What interval is it increasing on? What intervals? Um, and how do you see that very quickly? <coughs> where, is it, where is it increasing? Would mean the slope is? And you got a big old plus sign there, so it's going to be from negative 1 to 0. One to infinity. 
or is it, yeah, yeah. one to infinity. Oh, yeah. And where is it decreasing? Everywhere I left out. Negative infinity up to negative one, and zero to one. Is that cool? So don't let, once you make that little number line, you're golden. You just read it off of there. It's awesome. Uh, what else do I know? I know that it's concave. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. There's an inflection point. Inflection points at, uh, where'd you go? Plus or minus. Now, for the purpose of graphing, somebody help me out. What is 1 divided by square root of 3, roughly? 0.57. Yeah, 0.57. Okay. You guys are taking too long. Uh, comma, what was it? 22 over 9. What's uh, 22 over 9 is 2 and uh, 2.4444. Yeah. There's a, uh, those are my two inflection points. I like it. Concave up where? Uh, negative infinity to and negative one over add three, and or positive. one over add three to infinity. So it's concave down in between there, right? Negative one over add three to one over add three. I like it. So this is all the information that I've gathered so far. What else helps me graph things? What's some really good things to know about the function in order to graph it? Intercepts, right? So we already know one, and zero, three is, happens to be the max, and that also happens to be the y-intercept, that's awesome. Uh, how would you find x-intercepts? Has everybody got what they need from here, by the way? Fucking numbers. I like that. So you know, like, plug it in until you get lucky. I don't know. Can you factor this? Factors are positive for you to add to be negative 2? No. I like it. So you have to use a uh, quadratic formula. So negative b plus or minus square root uh, 4 minus 4 minus 12, right? So that imaginary, right? So minus. Oh, What's up? We're all right? Do you guys you guys with me? B squared minus 4ac and minus 4ac is minus 12. Or little b squared is only 4. It's going to be imaginary. So that means that this has... Come on. What would this normally find for me? This would find the uh, x-intercepts. It's imaginary, so this has no x-intercepts. I like it. Let me stop there for a second. Is that cool? If there were x-intercepts, I would have gotten real numbers here. And then I would have been able to plot them. Now, quick side note. I'm, I might send out to you guys a link to a really cool video series on YouTube that describes what complex numbers really are. Because there's just, we don't have anywhere to put that. There's a whole other axis that goes on top of things. It's like, do you ever wonder about what the hell happens to the answers you get here and where they actually are? Yes? If, oh shit, all right. Uh, I'll send you the link. In case you're curious, I'll let you watch it. It's really no time in the, in the curriculum. It really sucks because uh, there's a lot of cool shit about it. So there are no x intercepts. No x intercepts. But the y intercept is 0, 3. Okay. That's all we need right there. So try to graph this thing. And here's what really makes this easier is if you label what the points. Do what, what happens at the points. Because then as you do it, you're like, well, that's a minimum, so i got to go up. You know, So you'll see what I mean when I say this. So I don't look at the intervals. The intervals, I need you to be able to tell me where things are happening, but these actually don't help me graph it. So what I'll do is, uh, let's see, do I know, where'd it go? Here. So I have a, a rough idea of the scale I want to use. I know my maxes, I know my mins, I know my... Uh, my inflection points, so my scale could be nice and, and you know tight. But one, two, three, you know, very Fisher Price's prices. And in fact, it doesn't even. It looks like it's not even. Uh, there's no x-intercept, so. Whee! And let's see. It goes negative one point five seven seven. I like it. So, okay. One, two. Negative one, negative two. So my y-intercept is zero, three, and that actually also happens to be the max. So 
So put a little max there for yourself. Then you keep going. What else? I got mins at negative one, two, and one, two. I like it, I like it. And what else? I got? Inflection points at negative point six, roughly, right? So negative point six, sure. Negative point six, two point four. Sure, so that's, I'm sorry, min, min, inflection point, right? Good old yip man. There you go. It's uh, awesome. And then at positive point six, same place here, right? So that's right there, roughly. Inflection point. Okay, I like it. I like it. And, you know, uh, I erased it, but you would still have your, uh, your uh, first derivative test to look at. Uh, what was it? Was positive, negative, no. Negative, positive, negative, positive, right? Yeah. So that tells you, and you know your end behavior, too. So since it's decreasing and that's a minimum, I know it's going to come in like this. And it's, uh, it starts off concave what? I sort of incorporated that, but it starts with concave positive. So I'm not going to come at this point like this, because that would be concave down. So I know I start up here, and I know it's concave up. Until when? When is it not concave up anymore? At the yip, right? At the inflection point. That's where it changes concavity, because that's what inflection point means. Do you see what I mean by if you label the damn things, it's so much easier to actually graph it. So I just do on concave up until I hit this. And then the way to make this really sure that it's now concave down is I actually come at it from the other direction. Because sometimes it's weird to try to go, okay, what's it, you know, what's it look like now? Should... So then that's the maximum. So then it's concave down there. See? woo -hoo. I lock it. And then it's, still, it's concave down until when? Other point. Until the other inflection <coughs> point. And then I can come back at it. Then it's like I can start over here. It's up. Comes down and connects there, and it's concave up throughout the whole thing. Crazy. And you can always double check your work in the calculator. And this is why pre-calculus is, as I called it, graphing hell. It's because we've added extra layers on top. Your understanding of how to graph something has to be really pretty good, so I can add this extra shit on top of it. So, here, you guys try this product. And as I'm handing this out, I'm going to tell you that for some reason, Stuart made 4 5 a different section, but 4 5 is 4 3. 4 5 just brings in, like, oh yeah, you can find intercepts and end behavior. So basically, I just did 4 5. Right? 4 3 and 4 5 are the same thing. You'll see what I mean when you start doing it. Thank <laughs> you.